Welcome, fans of the DC Extended Universe, and I can use that name officially now because HBO <laughs> Max has used DC Extended Universe as an official title. So we were originally going by Justice League Universe, which was from the old uh, DC special that was on the CW, and Charles Roven and a few others on there used Justice League Universe. But I'm happy to go over to DC Extended Universe. Um, and I'm joined by Rebecca. We're going to be talking about Birds of Prey. So uh, Rebecca, thanks for being here. Yeah, no, I'm excited to be back here and, and doing another audio commentary. Yeah, these are always fun. Um, and we haven't given a lot of attention thus far to Birds of Prey, but we want to at least kind of watch the movie together and talk through it. This is Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn, directed by Kathy Yan. We have it queued up at the WB logo, so if you want to sync with us, go ahead and play the movie for about 12 seconds, and at the 12 second mark, when the WB logo stops in place, um, that's where you'll want to pause it. So first you'll see the Warner Brothers lot, and then you'll see the WB logo kind of moving back, and right when it stops, hit pause, and we will do a 3, 2, 1 play in just a moment. Um, so, Rebecca, I know this isn't one of your favorite movies in the DCEU. Both of us really love Batman v Superman. We analyzed Wonder Woman together. Man of Steel is a great movie. Um, but just real quick before we start, um, your quick reaction to having seen Birds of Prey, just to get a frame of reference as we go into it. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I'm not the biggest Birds of Prey fan in the world because I'm not an expert, but I do love the Birds of Prey. I love the TV show. I've mm. read a lot of the comics. Um, so going into... This film, I was really excited to see these characters that I love be portrayed on the big screen. I thought the the filmmaking itself was really good. I liked seeing, uh, you know, a perspective of a fi of a filmmaker. This is Kathy's take on these characters, and so I always respect that, no matter what I think about the storytelling choices or the techniques used. Um, I appreciate it from the, the filmmaking standpoint that it, it looks like it's her film. Yeah. But there are some choices that I I don't know that I would have made in terms of the tone and the way they treated some of the characters. Yeah. But I, I think it's a well-made film, so yeah. I'll give it that. And I think it's a, it's a good look into what someone sees when they see the birds of prey character. So, um, so I do like it from that standpoint. So it's maybe, maybe she didn't make some choices I would have made, but, right. uh, I, I like that I get to see her perspective on them. Right. Yeah. Such as creativity, right? Sometimes you can disagree right. with the choice, but still respect that they made their choice. Yeah. I, I don't have as much background with birds of prey. Um, but I did, I was kind of excited to see the movie just as carving out a different part of the universe. Um, I was excited to see Harley Quinn again. I think Margot Robbie's version of Harley Quinn is very, you know, entertaining to watch and interesting. Absolutely. Um, so that was fun to kind of follow forward. But I was pretty open to it, and uh, I enjoy it. I think they leaned into Harley's personality, I think, with some of the, like, film structuring and stuff like that, which is not a typical way that you would structure a movie, but I think they're kind of drawing inspiration from Harley's personality. So I think it's kind of fun to follow through. But we can uh, go ahead and get into it. So at that 12-second mark, we're going to say 3, 2, 1, play. So Rebecca, we'll hit it together. All right. 3, 2, 1, play. So we got the uh, Warner Brothers logo here. They did use the DC little um, kind of template here, which Shazam forgot to do. And Sandberg just apologized and said, oh, yeah, I forgot to put that in there. <laughs> but they do have the DC logo. You would think that would go through some sort of executive screening. Yeah, somebody else would have remembered instead of just one guy having to remember what it was. Yeah. So here, right away, this is where I started to kind of get the clue that they're using Harley Quinn herself as, like, the inspiration for the structure and kind of style of the movie. And it starts, like, right away this way, which, like, it's infused with Harley's personality, like, from the first moment of the film. Yeah, and, I mean, the film is mostly about her. It's called Birds of Prey, but this is really a Harley Quinn film. So I... I like that it focuses on Harley and her story because it really is about uh, what Harley's going through. And I do think this animation is really great. It's creative. It's quirky. It's very colorful like Harley. So uh, I think it's a good use of animation here to start yeah. start the story off because you never want to start a film off with a lot of exposition. And right. so this sort of helps things along when you use cutesy anima animation that uh, yeah. is eye catching and fun. Yeah, and has that personality. And it continues the DCEU tradition of having a, like, history lesson, quote-unquote, that's told in some sort of visual medium. Like, you know, we had the Krypton, Liquid Geo stuff, and we had, like, you know, the kind of Roman paintings from Wonder Woman, and we've had others, um, kind of the, you know, magical smoke kind of dust from Shazam. And so it's kind of like a, a cool little, you know, device that has been used in almost all the DCEU movies, I think. And this one, it's just right. kind of this colorful 2D animation with the personality and the humor. 
And it and it does retain the the history of what happened and what we saw in Suicide Squad. So it's it's good that they keep that continuity to use it to further this story. Yeah. And so the way I take the continuity is that, you know, Suicide Squad happened and then Joker broke Harley out. So they were together at the end of Suicide Squad. But then to me, after that, the breakup happened. Is that how you took it as well? Yeah, I, I think that's probably a fair reading of it. Yeah. And then I think also here, like the shortening her hair as she cuts it off is kind of also marking this is in the future from Suicide Squad. Because I think her hair length before she cut it was similar to Suicide Squad's, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think that's right. The The way she looks before she cuts it is more in line with the Suicide Squad film. Yeah. The hyenas, nice connection. Um, I also, like, in watching this movie, one thing I remember is there's this, like, list of kind of creepy guys who, like... <laughs> don't treat her very well or they objectify her or something and like right away we have the first guy here yeah like he's super super creep <laughs> yeah i like the use of the hy- the hyenas because that's such a uh, a random thing that is there in the animated series that you wouldn't think would be translatable to the the big screen but they found a way to make it work yeah um and they're already giving you a cue that there's going to be some gore and violence in this r-rated movie with the the man's leg just being chewed on down there that was pretty Yeah, good. that's a the, little gruesome. Yeah. I'm not, I, I will just warn people at the beginning, I'm not a super R-rated film guy. I like some of them, you know, that are R-rated, but it's not like my sort of, you know, rating of choice. Um, but I can understand why they did it for this film and I can go along with it if I have to. But the, the skating is a nice little foreshadowing of a big moment at the end of the movie. Yeah, and the R-rated, the R-rated aspects of this are if I remember correctly, are kind of few and far between. It's it's a lot of violence and um, maybe some sexual stuff, but uh, but it's not as bad. I think maybe it's also language. I guess is some of the R rating. Yeah, there's some definitely some language. There's quite a few broken bones, like there, like that. That one made me grimace in the theater. I remember that those broken legs. Um, but yeah, there's nothing like um, you know really overly sexual. There's sexual kind of situations, but there's nothing that's really like yeah. Uh, two exposed sexual kinds of things. But we did have another creep, by the way, the driver that's already two creeps like that have sort of, you know, <laughs> looked down at Harley and she shows them what's what. Yeah, there's a lot of creeps in this movie. <laughs> uh, especially um, the, the main creep, uh, Black Mask here. Yeah, Roman. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's an interesting character. I haven't put my finger on him yet, but I do know he's really intriguing to watch. Like, I immediately liked the performance from Ewan McGregor. Um, but I've seen this a few times now and I haven't quite pegged him other than he seems to like be super fragile and like super kind of narcissistic. Um, but yeah, he like his whole world seems like it's about himself. He never seems to give a thought to like other people. It's almost like other people don't really exist. It's like, you know, he's all about his possessions and his standing and his stature and whether he's pleased or not. Um, but I'm still trying to kind of figure him out. Yeah, who who doesn't love Ewan McGregor? I just he's one of my favorite actors. So yeah, he's fun to watch for sure. I, I enjoy him in this film, and I think he had a good time with the character. Like it really seems like he had fun with the role. Yeah, and and this uh, montage, this sort of fast forward going through the the night at the the nightclub, is a good yeah. way to track the the actions of what's happening without having to show everything. Yeah. And they're it's a good choice. Right. And they're definitely letting you know, again, kind of like the colors, you know, like this reds and purples and um, the greens right there. Like, I feel oh, like yeah. Kathy Ann and her team were like super aware of what colors they were putting on the screen. Like, look at that nice purple off to the right. Yep. Um, it's, it's like almost throughout the whole movie. It's really something that really sticks out in this movie. And they, they kind of let you know that they're working with a really rich color palette and like vibrant colors. Um, but they also kind of let you know that they're going to have some visual gags. They're going to have some humor gags, like, and some violence and broken bones. So they're definitely like, you should, it should be very clear to the audience, like what the tone is that they're going for right from the start. Yeah. And I think that's a good choice for a char- uh, a film that involves Harley Quinn as a character. Cause she is colorful and larger than life. Yeah. And, and there and she I had like... a little emotional depth with hearing the, the women talking about her. Yeah, yeah, like for one, one thing I noticed, like when guys are creepy or guys are saying things to her, she basically just like throws it back at them or takes care of them. But when those women were talking about her, it kind of like hit her more, hit her more like in the feels. Well, I'll tell you, as a female, as a woman, it it does cut deeper when another woman says mm-hmm. something negatively about you. There's just something about that that is is more hurtful. So yeah. I think that's a good way for them to approach it. 
So there's nice connections to Suicide Squad here, uh, like direct footage from Suicide Squad. Squad. The yeah, we get death. a little Ace Chemicals. Yeah. And I think this is a nice, you know, big cathartic moment. So, like, if we're going to track, you know, like, Harley's arc through this movie, you know, it comes off to a big bursting start with the Ace Chemicals explosion. She's saying she's trying to set off on her own, but it's going to take her a while to actually get to that point where she finds a kind of place for herself on her own. Um, I thought that was genius with the boot, by the way, like putting the boot onto the gas pedal, and then that sets it up where she has this really cool limp, uh, a limp coming up as she's walking away from those colorful explosions. Yeah. I thought that was just genius. To, the limp, to me, kind of makes this whole scene sort of like pop out even more. Yeah, it makes it more memorable, makes it a little more dy- dynamic. It's not so normal. But yeah, the the colors of the explosions even with the greens and the, there's a little bit maybe purple in there. Yeah, but it def- seems... definitely with the greens. And that looks like a comic book panel right there, like a oh, splash yeah, absolutely. page of like the colors behind her and her looking right at you know right at camera. Yeah, and that's a great way to bring in the the logo of the the title, the title card. Yeah. Now here we start to get the kind of nonlinear storytelling of just going a few minutes earlier. Um, it's kind of you know frenetic and stuff, and it moves us around quite a bit. But for me, I try to just think of it like I said as like. Harley's way of telling the story and Harley isn't just going to tell it straight through like Harley's going to jump around as things occur to her and she's like oh yeah I forgot this and I forgot that let me tell you about this so she pops around because she's a little bit crazy like that well and there's something funny even the four minutes ago to me is it like a funny gag because it's not <laughs> yeah. it's not something that we have to go back a while it's like no it's just four minutes ago just four minutes before this where we're, we're yeah. going back <laughs> so that that even to me that seems like a Harley thing so Rene Montoya, I've read in like different versions of Rene Montoya in different comics. Um, but I'm I'm also like you. I'm kind of open to seeing new versions of characters, and uh, I think this is cool to bring Rosie Perez in, kind of like a you know somewhat of a well known actress, um, and putting a new spin on it. And how right in this first scene, you kind of find out like she's more in tune with things and has a keener eye than the other police officers and the other detectives, and so she's kind of competent, but she also has a lot of issues in this movie. Like she has her work problems, she has her drinking problems, she has her ex, you know, ex-girlfriend problems. So she's kind of a messed up kind of character, but she's also like she sees things a lot clearer than other people do. Yeah, she's a flawed character, but she's good at what she does. So uh that makes me respect her a little more and ca- and care about her because she is going through some things. Yeah. Here we get a little bit of an intro of uh who will become Huntress or who we will find out later is Huntress, but We don't get a lot of Huntress in the beginning of the movie. Like, this is, you know, a little bit of her. But Huntress really doesn't come in until the really later parts of the movie. And and the way the stylistically, the way that it's it's sort of Renee telling the story of what she thinks happened at this crime scene, where where it's mixed in where with us seeing the crime happen, I think mm-hmm. that's a really cool filmmaking uh, technique there, so that we yeah. get to see that while Renee is figuring it out. I, I really like that choice. Yeah, that was cool, and it made it more memorable. Like it made it memorable that that scene had happened and who did it because of the way they inter interspersed it. To me, yeah. it made it like pop out more as I was watching it. And this is cool. I'd like to yeah. So Montoya like figures out right away, like, well, this means this, and she can draw the, like, correct conclusions from stuff. Yeah, she's a smart character. Rosie Perez, I think, does a really good job uh, portraying her as this sort of hardened, uh, wise cop yeah. who's who's probably seen a lot of stuff there in Gotham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we met uh, Roman in his club, which is kind of one side of him, but now we're seeing Roman, you know, in the dark underbelly of his his crime operations and his sort of him and Zaz's weird kind of like thirst for violence. It's pretty creepy. Oh yeah, this is another like nonlinear one. Like he says like, I gave you a good pitch, didn't I? And like obviously he's cutting his face off and it's not till a little bit later that we'll see like what the pitch was and what Roman was trying to do. So again, it's like kind of out of order. Yeah. I, I like films that do that. You have to pay attention to it. So uh, that, that I, I like the ability to tell a story in a new way. Okay, that face is kind of creepy. But that's kind of from DC Comics. There's been DC Comics' fair share of sliced faces. They, they've they cut off faces and worn them, and it's it's bizarre and gross and terrible. But yeah. that is uh, something that has happened. 
um, this version of Zaz, I think, pretty quickly became my favorite version. Um, I mean, there's been a couple good ones, but um, this guy, uh, I think is I wrote down his name. Let me see if I can remember what the heck it was. Chris Messina. Um, I thought he did an amazing job with Zaz. Like, he just seems, like, psychopathic. Like, he is almost enjoying the violence, and then he is just goading Roman into just even worse places than he already was. Um, it's just a terrible character. Oh, and that you... See, here you're starting to see, like, Roman... Like he was gonna surprise or gonna leave her, and then the snot bubble is enough to just turn him over. Like you, yeah, that he's a monster, man. It, terrible. Yeah, there's a little glimpse of the mask, real quick. Yeah, the the only thing I don't like about some of the the filmmaking is that the idea that you have to put the the text of the character names up there. Yeah, I guess I guess it's sort of a comic booky thing, maybe to do, but. It sort of makes me feel like you don't trust me enough to pay attention. Yeah. Uh, I like the juxtaposition of the peeled face and then all of a sudden the eggs and bacon. Like, to me, yeah. that's almost like the filmmakers toying with us, being like, hey, remember that peeled face you just saw? Well, now we're going to try to, like, smooth that into bacon, you know? It's creepy. But, Something uh, yeah, that we... would be delicious to eat. <laughs> right next to, yeah, like juxtaposed right together. But no, with the text on the screen, I wondered about that if, like, Kathy Ann and the team, if they like felt like they wanted to do that because of Suicide Squad, like especially the theatrical oh, version true. of Suicide Squad that they put all that text on and maybe they kind of drew inspiration from that and saying like, well, that can be some connective tissue between the Suicide Squad Harley kind of, you know, uh, franchise. That's true. There was a little bit of that in Suicide Squad. It doesn't mean it's good, but it just mean that they were maybe thinking of it as a connective kind of thing. Well, and I think now that you mentioned that, then maybe that makes it a little better. Um, my wife, I watched this in theaters with my wife who, and she really liked the movie. And, but this was one moment that like won her over. Cause my wife loves like breakfast sandwiches and she's like, Oh yeah, I can relate to this. <laughs> I mean, that does look good. Genuinely. Yep. I would be uh, into eating that. Yep, definitely. And it's, it's kind of a little motif for the movie, right? Like she, she wants to just enjoy kind of simple things like that and she really can't because of all the turmoil that happens and then at the end of the movie it kind of comes around it also makes me think of like suicide squad where she was you know dreaming about some kind of normalcy you know and just having a good breakfast sandwich is like something a normal person would do and she's harley so she can't really ever have anything normal (laughs) she's got hyenas in her house in her apartment (laughs) she's she's not really a normal person she is a compulsive person which is also like suicide squad and just the character overall I like this gag, though, of uh, all the people that want to kill her now, that she's, like, fair game. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that is true. Uh, She has not made friends. And I guess that's part of the the story, too, is that she ends up finding people who could be her friends. uh, Mm -hmm. And that's something that maybe is a little uh, new to Harley because she's made so many enemies. Mm Mm-hmm. Rosie Perez's face is just good sometimes. Her facial expressions it's, are fitting. I know we've talked a lot about like daytime versus nighttime scenes with some of these films in the DCEU. Yeah. Um, uh, what I like about this being during the daytime is not necessarily like, oh, daytime scenes make it good. It's uh, the idea that some of this crime stuff happens in Gotham during the day. That yeah. that I find because you know when you think about Gotham, you usually think about nighttime and rain, yeah. and so to know that some of this craziness happens during the day too sometimes it, that that's funny to me. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it comes from all angles, like from above and from behind and from in front. It's just everywhere. <laughs> Why would anyone live in Gotham? I don't know. <laughs> the age-old question. Yeah. Oh, this is funny, too. She's going to smell like the garbage Montoya is. That's a close call. And oops. Man. So the the winking at the camera and stuff is also something that I think Harley Quinn can get away with. Um, I don't think I would like it from some other characters if this was a different movie. But with Harley, I feel like it somehow fits pretty well. Yeah, I think some of that cheeky nature of uh, some of the dialogue and some of this, the scenes and the way she plays it, I think it does fit. I'm also curious, I haven't really studied the, the stuff, like the jacket she's wearing, but part of it mm-hmm. looks like a crime scene tape. 
Oh. And and um, I don't know what that is. It's almost like a like a, a rain jacket, but it's got streamers and stuff. Uh, yeah. There was a quick look at Joker's back, at least. So he he was in the film as a stunt double, kind of. Uh, yeah, you're right. Like there is caution tape. You're right. It's like sliced up amongst the other stuff on her sleeves. Do you, do you think she made that for herself? You think? I wonder. I, it seems like something she would make. Yeah, it doesn't seem like anybody else would make it. I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Huntress again, or the crossbow killer at this point. I like the uh, the purple in her helmet. Yep, that's right. We're kind of shining off the glass. The, the purple visor. question marks. Yep. They do play her up as a mysterious figure uh, for yeah. most of the film. Yeah. So the first time I watched it, um, I I liked Huntress a lot, but I didn't like her until the end of the movie. And like at the very end of the movie, I realized like, oh, wow, I really like Huntress's character. But they really save her. Like they don't really let her breathe until the last act of the movie almost. But yeah, you're right. They tease her a little bit. And I think they were doing it on purpose. Like they know that they were holding Huntress for the end. Yeah. But I like this gag about how she smells like garbage and the, all the other guys. So, again, it's like guys that are just putting women down and kind of talking down to them in the workplace and stuff. Um, well, her smelling like garbage means she's out there doing her job. She's actually yeah. out in the field doing things. If they're just kind of sitting around pushing paperwork, they're not seeing any of the action. Montoya yeah. is the one who has to, you know, change her clothes and get to smelling a little better because she's actually, she's actually out there doing stuff. Right. And then here's the guy that took credit for some of her past work. So again, there's there's definitely some kind of like gender dynamics in the movie of, you know, the way that the guys talk to and the way that guys treat women and then the way that men sometimes get credit for women's work and stuff. It's definitely woven in there. Um, I don't think they ever like, you know, hit the audience over the head with it, but they just definitely sprinkle it throughout the whole movie. Yeah, I think it's done fairly well in this film. It's not too preachy and i think the reason it's not for me is that you actually see montoya trying to do her job and she's doing it well and uh sometimes you have to when you do that even if even if she wasn't a woman you could still put a guy in that position and him still mm -hmm. being dismissed by his superiors for not being good enough and it would still yeah. be as just as a com you know compelling story so I, I like that the way that it almost doesn't even seem like they're playing her as a woman in some respects, because right. even if she was a guy, it would still be a struggle. Yeah. And it would be like more preachy if they had a scene where Montoya like chews out the captain and says like, you took the credit for this and that was actually my blah, blah, blah. And you know, you've been stealing my thunder. Like if she had that scene, it would be kind of too preachy. But instead what they do is like, I remember later there's a scene where Montoya just says to that guy, like captain, you know, and she kind of like enunciates his title because like between them, they know that he got the promotion because of that. But all she yeah. needs to do is just say captain, you know. And so to me, that's like a much more subtle way to just spread it in there. Yeah. And also uh, that Bertinelli sequence uh, was mm -hmm. really great. Uh, the way they sort of wove some of uh, Helena Huntress's backstory in there made it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the reasons that I have problems with, because Huntress is one of my favorite DC Comics characters. I, I cosplayed mm. as Huntress one year at Dragon Con. I was <laughs> I was terrible. I made my own costume. It was awful. But uh, but just to feel like Huntress for a day was awesome for me. Yeah, cool. uh, I, ca I carried away uh, around a, you know, a toy crossbow and all that kind of stuff. So I like Huntress a lot. And so my conflict with this film is that sometimes they would treat her as a serious character and sometimes they don't. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to that a little bit later because there are a couple scenes where they, they don't take her quite as seriously. But I like that sequence with the Bertinelli to, to show kind of where she comes from yeah. and what her whole deal is. Right. Yeah, the, definitely the childhood you know, massacre thing is, is pretty poignant and I think well done. And they, you know, they gave us the glimpse of it there, but then they'll show us some more kind of context about it later. Uh, and I do know that there might have been changes in like or like reshoots with like the diamond and what the diamond was containing and that sort of thing. But I'm fine with what they did for the theatrical release, because I think what they were trying to do was make sure that the diamond was tied to Huntress, which tied her in to everybody else. Like, I think they were trying to maybe make a tighter knot of how everybody is really related in the plot, which I'm OK with. You know, it's kind of cool how they all come together by the end. 
So I have a big thing about character reveals. And so I love this mm-hmm. shot of Harley in the hat with the sunglasses and all that because it's such a unique look. But mm-hmm. I have a problem with the first reveal of Dinah Lance, Black Nary, is her sitting on a toilet in a <laughs> in a of like a nightclub bathroom. Oh, man. <laughs> to me, that feels like a disrespect to that character. Mm. Well, the Harley stuff is done really, really well. Like, there's a lot of, um, I mean, even the sequence when she's going in the, the, the police department, it feels like there's a lot of care that goes into, like, showing Harley being awesome. And yeah. to see Black Canary introduced in the way she is, like, her first shot is, I was so disappointed with that. Yeah. Um, this scene, though, again, like like we were talking about with Ace Chemicals, like the colors are front and center, and they're obviously like very purposely chosen to have her coming through the red and blue with her red and blue hair, you know, matching yeah. up. Yeah, it's and, beautiful. Uh, yeah, uh, and just a memorable, it makes a, a scene in a cool setting, like her going through the police department is pretty, you know, awesome to think about, but then adding all this color to it, um, especially against like the kind of gray and blue and black of a police department to bring all these colors into it is uh really kind of unique like i think this is like you were saying probably where like the creators made a good film like in terms of filmmaking yeah and it's actually it also makes it more effective for harley when she comes in there's a a little hyena statue back there um but uh but it's actually effective for harley to come in through all that smoke because she's a i mean let's be honest she's a woman she probably wouldn't be able to take down all these cops because men are just stronger than women most of the time and so uh for her to come in through the smoke and some of that stuff to distract them i think actually plays an effective uh way to to enter into all of that yeah um and the gymnastics moves that she's doing and stuff are are still around and they're going to be pretty strong throughout the whole movie now see this is a better entrance for if they just would have had this shot for (laughs) yes This should have been how they first introduced Black Canary, not her sitting in uh, in the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. So that was, that was actually a beautiful shot. And you see some of so the, 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 uh, the famous fishnets in her wardrobe. Mm-hmm. Mm. They play around with a little bit of that in her, her gloves. Yeah, and it's cool. Like, I think um, uh, Journey Smollett... Um, bell i think she likes actually sang her own part too right like on the soundtrack that's her singing i think i that seems right i don't know for sure but that seems right mm-hmm. and i like the idea of uh black canary being a singer they they did play with that in some of the comic uh runs mm-hmm. for her and i think it's really fitting because black canary yeah. is known for her voice yep. so yeah. her her sonic you know her sonic screen or her scream or her canary cry and so it makes sense that yeah. she would um be an effective singer yeah, and I thought it was a really organic way to tie her with, you know, Roman and stuff to have her in the club yeah. as the singer. It's like, okay, good, we got like the pieces in place, and now we can see where they go. But this is that deal that he was trying to make um, with the person who got his face cut off. So this is, you know, flashing back a little bit. And again, we're Harley in the police department. Kind of, she explicitly says in the narration, you know, like, oh wait, I need to probably back up and tell you this. Like, so she. So the kind of scattered timeline is just part of how Harley rolls. Yeah, she would she would forget things while she's telling you the story. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. So I'm not too knowledgeable about the Golden Lions if they're from the comic books or anything like that, but that's okay. I'm not uh, sure either, to be honest. Yeah, that's all right. Um, but here, Roman's reaction, that's the important thing, right? He, yeah. He can't stand this. I love his, like, velvet jacket there. And the little pocket, yeah. Yeah, the blue jacket. It looks very soft. Yeah, and the glasses and... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he looks cool. He's a monster, but he looks cool. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, his his, uh, wardrobe is is definitely something else in this movie. (laughs) He stands out for sure. I'm interested in the the hands with the eyes uh, behind Black Canary, yeah. um, because a lot of times when you see eyes like that in a story, like I'm thinking about The Great Gatsby, things like that, where uh, when you see eyes like that, it's almost like the all-seeing eye, like God is mm-hmm. watching you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So that's kind of what I see when I, I see shots like that. Yeah. You see a little glimpse of the canary cry breaking well, the kinda, glass. It kind of makes sense to me because, like, Canary is watching Roman, and she kind of watches him and watches him, and she gets more uncomfortable, and then she kind of decides to finally, like, you know, turn on him and stuff. Yeah. So to me, she is kind of in the position of watching what he's doing, and then when she's had enough of it, she really can turn the table on him. And and physically, just from her position on the stage, she can see everything. Mm-hmm. And at first, she's an observer for quite a while, but then... Like, with Harley, she's an observer, and then she decides, well, I really need to act and, and intervene in just a moment here with Harley. And the same thing with Roman. She observes Roman, she observes him, and then she finally, like, she finally tries to tip off the police, and then she finally, like, actually just takes it into her own hands, you know, at the end. Yeah, she so. metaphorically gets off the stage and goes into the crowd mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and is among the people. Yeah. No, I think she's a, you know, I, th- I agree there might be some ups and downs with how she plays through the whole movie, but overall I definitely enjoyed just having a black canary in the universe. Oh, I think she did a great job. Uh, there's a there's one scene that we'll we'll talk about when we get there, but uh, there there was a scene in this film that made me wish I could see more of her mm-hmm. um, because I, I think she did really do a good job as, as black canary and um, yeah. some of her interplay with some of the other characters was really good. Yeah. Yeah, I think her kind of, like, very calm demeanor, and she's just kind of cool and, and like, always even-keeled, I think plays off well against Harley, who's just kind of crazy frenetic, and then also off of Huntress, who's kind of, like, rage-filled sometimes. Um, So I I think that the mix of personalities is pretty good. Yeah, and I always sort of see Black Canary as one of the leaders of Birds of Prey, Um, so it makes sense that she would be sort of the one who thinks through things a little more... Mm -hmm. When everybody else might be impulsive, she's the one sort of methodically thinking through through things. Mm-hmm. And I think it looks like a nicotine patch on um, Black Canary there, too, on yep. Dinah Lance, um, which they never really talk about, I don't think. They just sort of subtly put it in there. And that's kind of nice. It's another thing where it just shows, like, these characters are dealing with other things, too, beyond the plot. They have their own things that they're dealing with and Harley's dealing with, you know. And so, But they don't hit you over the head with it. They kind of just, like, you know, layer it in there for the audience to pick up if they're paying attention. Well, and if you think about a singer or even Black Canary with her voice, smoking cigarettes would not be good for her. That would be uh, something that would impact her, not only her health, but her voice, her ability to sing. Uh, So that would be a flaw that would come with her characters, that she's doing something that would uh, negatively impact her voice. Right. Another creepy guy, by the way, this lonesome guy, total creep again. Well... Sometimes I just think about, you know, what my mom told me growing up, you know, nothing good happens after midnight. So that's just some good advice to everybody who's listening to this. Just be careful about where you go, who you hang out with. Make good choices. Yeah. And Harley needs some friends looking out for her, which she's starting to have here kind of. Yeah, and that's what I think I, I like about the way Black Canary is uh, portrayed in this film is because Black Canary is, uh, for uh, the, the iterations that I know of, she is a defender of women. She, uh, she will go after guys who abuse women, things like that. So I like the idea that she's used in this scene where she's sort of defending um, Harley against these creepy guys. Mm-hmm. I think it's character correct. Yeah. I also like here that like her kicks look like real kicks. Like I think she actually was just kicking the stunt guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's also pretty cool. Like the action in this film is is not too bad, really. Yeah. I'd say. Like the stunts, they really kind of went all out. Yeah, she does. I mean, some of those kicks are, are legit. Yeah, they hopefully had some pads in there, but I think that yeah pretty good like that to me was like pretty believable like it it looked actually just pretty believable that she actually took out those guys and it's nice that roman is now roman is now watching her and he's yeah he's of course having his like kind of corrupt look on it he's just thinking like oh like he's not actually concerned about the guys that just got totally beat up and he's just thinking like oh how can this benefit me maybe she becomes my driver so like roman to me is always about himself yeah nice head through the window but 
And I like the wardrobe here with Black Canary as well, with the, the blue and the, the gold. She's got a little bit of the canary gold, but some of the blue mm. that comes with the, the comic book iteration of the character. Mm -hmm. And Black Canary and typically has a, like a choker or a necklace around her neck uh, in the, the comics and, uh, you know, JLU. Uh, even on Arrow, uh, she was typically seen with a choker. So I like that she's got a necklace on in the scene. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, and the the color also kind of goes in with the alley wall being kind of the blue and yellow on the sides of the yeah. alley walls, I'm noticing. Yep. And then the car is kind of a yellowish, so they kind of tie it all together. Um, there, Zaz is just, I think that actor is really good with Zaz. But also, I just noticed this time that, like, he just tells her, you're going to be the driver now. Like, they don't ask her. So, again, it's kind of like the men have just decided for the women, like, this is what you're going to do. Right. This is a nice little add, add into the setting. It's and this, fun. this what, what I also like about this scene in particular, it looks like a real place. Like somebody yeah. would really live here. Looks like real world. Yep. I definitely like this interaction with uh, Cassandra Kane and then Dinah being empathetic. Yeah, so this, like, is right this, this is that scene I was talking about that like this makes me want to see more of uh, this Black Canary is yeah. this scene between her and Cassandra. Yeah, to me, this like struck home as just a really real way that people would interact and a very compassionate person who kind of knows how this feels and gives like just the right kind of advice. Like she's not saying like, you know, hey, just keep your chin up. And like she doesn't just give some kind of meaningless platitudes. She tells her like, hey, this is bad. I know this sucks, but like it will get better. Like try to pull through it. You know, to me, that seems like more authentic kind of advice to try to give to somebody like that. And it seems like it comes from a real place for her that she's probably um, been through something like that. Yeah. I'm also noticing more about the color there. Like Cassandra Kane had kind of a purplish jacket on and the stairs and the banister were kind of like purplish as well. I swear they were like, the creators were like on next level of color, color coordination. Yeah. And now we're back to the, the faces just getting cut off, I think. So we're kind of circling back. Yeah. He said, ew. Uh, so that, that seems to be a thing. He doesn't, uh, like to be there. He thinks it's gross, but he still, I guess, enjoys doing it. Yeah. So now we're getting some more character connections. Like, so we're, we're kind of getting pairwise connections, you know, uh, these two, um, Dinah and Cassandra. Um, but we won't get like, you know, the full connection of the whole squad towards like act three, basically. Yeah. But I think it's pretty well structured. I know it's like. It's non-conventionally structured, and I think I didn't really appreciate it my first or even second viewing, but I'm kind of appreciating how they kind of wove everything together. Yeah, they do a good job of uh, having the characters interact with each other and making those relationships feel real like they would actually bond in some way. Mm -hmm. Because by the end of the film, they have to f form a team. Yeah. So uh, so I like that they they made it so that it didn't feel so jarring at the end. Yeah. Um, so there was a reference to her mother. Um, so Montoya is aware of the mother and also referred to the power. So there's definitely a kind of an interesting backstory here that we, we only get glimpses of. Yeah. And that's that's very character correct from the comics that uh, the Black Canary that we think of is actually the, the second Black Canary. So in the comics, uh, Black Canary, Dinah Lance, her mother is... Uh, is a black canary as well. And so it's sort of passed down from the mother to the daughter. So I like the idea that maybe there was some form of black canary that Montoya had uh, previously interacted with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the mother daughter connection is slightly interesting because like Roman also has like his father, there's like reference, I think in dialogue of like Roman's father kicking him out or something like that. So I can't remember what it was, but something about Roman's dad too. No, well, parents are very important in the DC extended universe. So, <laughs> yeah, I like that continuation in continuation even in this film. Yeah, this set is an interesting set, um, like a villain set kind of with his statues and his shrunken heads and his masks. And so the mask obviously has the connection there, but kind of just a creepy like like what kind of person would enjoy this kind of setting for yourself? <laughs> yeah, well, it is a villain lair. You know, got to yep. got to really embrace that villain layer vibe. And now th the windows kind of match his pants and jacket somehow. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
U using that light and that color. Yeah. Oh, and even on the table, there's even that same color. That's wow. It does. Heads. It does bring everything together and make it feel um, like everything. Everything. Every element of the scene is kind of brought together. Yeah. I love his just way of speaking. There's the you again. <laughs> the you <laughs> and the I love it is maybe kind of telling, right? Like you're yeah. saying with the violence, like the you, he's like disgusted, but he's also obviously drawn to it. He, like, yeah. It's kind of an interesting paradox there. <laughs> this is an interesting statue of himself. Yeah. yeah, I think you're you're right on with the the narcissism. Of, you know, who who would make a statue of yourself? I I don't think I would. <laughs> Nobody would want to see that statue. Yeah. So okay, so Joker and Harley broke up. So now Roman knows about this, and so he's gonna say like, "All right, what do I want to do with this? She belongs to me." That's interesting. That's a a good character moment of uh, Dinah studying the mm -hmm. the statue there. Yeah. So again, Roman's like, "How is this about me?" And then he's do as you're told. Yeah. This he's definitely. I think I haven't pegged it pretty well with everything is about him. I think that's going to be pretty consistent. This is a nice little pickpocketing sequence. I like the the use of music here. Yeah, there's a few good um, music, I think, choices that are pretty cool. I think this soundtrack has all women, like on the whole soundtrack, I think oh, it's cool. women artists. Yeah. And yeah, like just as a film, like we had Wonder Woman, you know, directed by Patty Jenkins, but this one took it to another level of like the writing, producing with Margot Robbie, the directing, and a lot of the production team women and the soundtrack women. Um, so it's just really going to a, a whole nother level, I think. I like that moment that uh, Cassandra could pick uh, Black Canary's pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, that's Di the only Dinah one. Dinah was too good. Yep. <laughs> but man, Zaz is like, you have the most important thing you've ever had in your pocket, and he's just standing there like an idiot. <laughs> not very smart for Cassandra, though, to go back around to the spot that she had already ripped off. Yeah, <laughs> you're not supposed to go back to the scene of the crime. supposed to go in a different direction. <laughs> what is she doing? Yeah. And I got to tell you, I love this look. I know I'm talking a lot about Black Canary's like clothing uh -huh. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But uh but this blue suit, I don't know yeah. that I would wear like the top there under the jacket, but it's a cool like use of color and the styling is so good and it really yeah. looks good on her. Yeah, I agree. And she looks like somebody who would work like kind of at a nightclub setting. Mhm. Mm and then I think Cassandra's actually clothing fits too. Like she just has kind of a baggy t-shirt on with like, you know, windbreaker sort of jacket or something like she's more of just a kid on the street, you know. And it would also be something she could hide stuff in. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Pockets and yeah. baggy. Yeah. People aren't going to notice it if it's a, a little baggy. Swallowing the, the diamond is interesting. That's going to kind of be a big plot point for the rest of the movie. So Zaz really thinks he can like outsmart Roman. He like he tries to steer Roman in certain ways, tries to suggest things to him and lead him, and then he also here just thinks he can kind of like lie to Roman about what actually happened and stuff. Like I think Zaz he he works for Roman, but I think Zaz thinks he's actually like in charge of things and he's actually running the show. Uh, cuz I think Zaz thinks he can just pull Roman's strings. <laughs> Roman's a little bit of a loose cannon. <laughs> Why is this happening to me? See, it's all about him. Yeah, yeah. And he even said something about how Harley belonged to him. Yeah. So, yeah. He does He does see people as possessions. Yeah. And there's another good shot of Dinah just observing. Like, she's off to the side, and then the shot is just of Dinah, like, listening and kind of looking at what's happening. Yep. I think we've discovered something here, Sam, with uh, the, way, <laughs> the way they're using Dinah here. Yep. See, and she's got that inner struggle. 
Yep. It's well acted, too. This is interesting with Harley right in the center stage and the light kind of dropping on her and the guys around the background. It's already kind of... So I know that this song sequence is coming, like the kind of Material Girl song. Mm -hmm. Um, But now that I know it's coming, visually I can see they're already kind of setting it up with the backup dancers like behind her. (laughs) Yeah. And in the spotlight, you know, it's a... It it looks like a theatrical performance is about to happen. Yeah. Uh, now we get his grievances. Uh, all the people that have grievances against Harley. Oh, pronounced it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Pete and his brood. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, he's got a lot. <laughs> yeah, we're, <laughs> co- we're. I wish we could stop and go through all those. <laughs> Somebody will, I'm sure, online. There, there was a lot going on there. So the the pink kind of like the fluorescent pink sort of thing is really popping out because it's almost black. You know, this scene is very black. Yeah. Um, but then it makes Harley like almost fluorescent. Well, and she's the the only colorful thing in the room. Yep. I like this how she, I like how Harley just does not put up with the kind of typical villain tropes. She just like cuts right through it with her sarcasms. Well, she probably knows about villain tropes, having <laughs> yeah. been with the Joker and yeah. done all sorts of crazy things. And speaking of yeah. continuity with the Joker, I, I like that they kept up with the uh, tattoos here with her. Yeah. I was just looking at that tattoo, like that was towards camera. If her hair covered the R, it would say Otten, which is my last name. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shout out to you. It's an it's a Sam Otten <laughs> Easter egg. That's what we're going to consider. So that's good, too. With the earlier, we saw the face slicing scene. So that makes this a little bit more threatening to have Zaz coming in because we like know what happens in that situation. So... That was good. But yeah, again, like even though Harley's obviously just making a play for her life, Roman is still just intrigued enough that he wants his diamond, that he's willing to go go along with it. And to your point card. about how they're um, setting up the, the theatrical aspect of the scene, um, you know, uh, Roman is sitting there eating popcorn. So it's almost mm-hmm. like he is he's waiting for some sort of performance to happen. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, he's sitting down in the audience to watch the show. Also, I've heard in a lot of movies, like, to make your villain unlikable, have them eating food, because it usually kind of annoys the audience, you know, if he's smacking on popcorn or something. Interesting. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back I think I first heard about that in, in uh, Lord of the Rings. Like, I think in uh, oh. The Two Towers, I think there's, like, a scene where definitely the king is, like, really feasting on some food and it's like wow it really makes you dislike a guy and then after i heard that i started noticing in other movies like oh yeah just have him eating food and it like turns off the audience it's really here's the uh, material girl kind of and the some classic kind of marilyn monroe sort of look i think the scene is really the song choice is really interesting because diamonds are a girl's best friend also comes into play big time in moulin rouge which Mm. also starred uh ewan mcgregor hmm With a violent edge to it, though. A little bit. (laughs) Saz is getting in on the dance scene. I forgot about that. The editing here is remarkably good. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cutting back into the reality with the slap. That's very Mm -hmm. good. So do you think that's uh that's heart like what Harley's imagining while she's sitting there? Yeah, so like she I don't think she was actually knocked out and I don't think she's been given any hallucinogens or anything. So it's not quite like Suicide Squad where she had like some flashbacks and stuff. But yeah, I think it's basically like to her she's in that chair, she's with these guys around her and she's like I can just think of this as something completely different. It's like a little bit of her kind of craziness, but Maybe, like, her trying to process it, like, trying to get through this trauma by putting herself in a uh, more fanciful, kind of. fanciful yeah. position. Yeah, I, it also could be something where it's like, uh, so for me, this film, I have not analyzed it, like, in the same way that I do for Man of Steel or um, BVS, because I also think this one is not 
always asking for that like depth of analysis. Like I think they're going for like we said more of a humorous tone, a little bit frenetic, very colorful, playful. Um, so uh, that dance scene like that, I kind of just take it in stride as like, all right, it's Harley, it's a bit crazy, you know, it's an interesting visual, and you know, there it was. Whereas like BVS, you know, if we have like Bruce Wayne has a vision, it's like, oh, that was very much connected to other things, and there's a certain way that it happened, you know. Right. Oh, there's the little uh, Captain Boomerang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Digger Harkness. Yep. So now we're back into the flow of the police department incident. Now we know all the information we need to know, I think. Yeah, the uses of the, the dark blues here are very good. It makes everything yeah. cold, makes everything feel dingy. I'm also noticing another thing that happens with the nonlinear storytelling is that you can have your action scenes spaced out better. Because, yeah. like, if it was linear, then all of this police department thing would just be, like, a really long action scene with, like, two layers. But by by stopping and saying, oh, wait, I need to tell you about this and this, it gave us a chance to have the action scene on the first floor and then the action scene, like, in the basement. And it makes those action sequences stand out a little more because you can remember them a little better because they are spaced out. Yeah. Yeah, I like my action in kind of, like, well-paced doses. Like, I'm not... I like action, but I don't want it to be like action upon action upon action. Uh, I like it to be kind of spaced out. And this one also lets them kind of do a scene change where now we have, like you said, the different color palette and we have the water. Instead of like all the uh, colorful explosions, we now have the water and like the splashes on the floor and stuff that adds dynamic energy to the scene. But it's a different aesthetic than the upstairs scene or the other the other part of the police department. Yeah, and I think the idea of having the water come in is really cool. But one of the things that really turned me off from this movie, which made me question a lot of the sort of the female director aspect that people were talking about, mm -hmm. is that to me as a woman, I'm watching this and I see Harley wearing a white T-shirt and she's in a scene where she's completely soaked fighting a bunch of guys. Yeah. Well, if Zack if Zach Snyder shot this... People would be enraged that yeah, he, a, a woman was... I mean, it's basically a wet t-shirt contest is what this is. Yeah. And so somehow a woman gets a pass, you know, a female director gets a pass for doing that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of an issue with that because while I would normally care about it, like, people would be enraged if that was a Zack Snyder scene. So to yeah, me, there's a yeah. bit of a double standard that goes along with, with some of these, like, female director type yeah. things like we, we're for forgiving of this and we're going to let this go if it's yeah. a female directed scene but we wouldn't do it if it was a man right if it was a guy like that last slide would have been called a crotch shot and then the whole yep. thing would have the, the director would have been boycotted probably yeah it just but. kind of annoys me it's like if we're going to have standards let's let's make them even across the board yeah it's a cool scene though i mean i i think it's a great scene yeah, if I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. If I if I put that aside and I just think about the water is a cool visual, and then the stunts again were like pretty good stunts. So just on that level, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, this guy reminds me of the dad from uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. There's a, I don't know if you watch that show, but there, yeah. <laughs> Mac has a dad who almost looks just like that guy. He looks like a mean dude. <laughs> And now we get a third action scene, so I am really glad that they broke it up because it would have been three in a row instead of, you know, just two. And all, they probably and wouldn't have been able different. to do it. They would have had to rewrite it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one is like the storage, the uh, evidence closet, evidence locker kind of action scene. Harley gets a bat. I like how she doesn't go for the chainsaw. She goes for the bat, and she's yeah. really good with this bat. Like, this is amazing bat work in this scene. I remember this. And she's that that's you know, she's doing some reminiscent things of Suicide Squad, but she really I think Ooh. in this movie, her gymnastics and stuff goes to another level than Suicide Squad. Yeah. I think in Suicide Squad there was never like quite as awesome gymnastic kind of fighting as this movie. Yeah, and I think some of the slow motion there with the bat was really well executed because it it gave it a little bit of a flare, like the slow motion uh, return back to her hands. Because uh, mm -hmm. sometimes I think people use slow motion a little too much, but that that looked really nice. Yeah, and they don't do it very much. They just pick a few spots, I think. This is a good swing, too. Like, it's a, a legit bat swing. Well, bats and mallets are her thing. Mm-hmm. 
and I like it in this movie that they have the bat, um, kind of like Suicide Squad, but they also have the mallet. They kind of give her both because yeah. she gets a lot more time to breathe in this movie. You hit somebody in the face of the bat. That's going to hurt. <laughs> I don't care who you are. Yeah, that's another thing. Like I mentioned it with uh, Black Canary, but this one also like, oh, yeah, that... broken bone. Yeah, yeah, I like that's... how she goes for the next one. Oh, <laughs> like, geez. man. Oh, I remember when I watched this in rough. theater. I was like, yeah, I definitely felt that first leg break. And then I was really just surprised that she went for the other leg. That was that, that, was that guy is not walking for a long time, if at all. Yeah. But what I was saying was that how I appreciate that they really choreographed the action believably where like, so nothing against women, but like, you have to kind of convince me that a woman could take out like four pretty strong guys. But the way they choreographed is like, oh, wow, no, it actually looks like she did take out those four guys. No, I I agree. I completely agree because sometimes people, I it's hard for me sometimes to because I know I wouldn't be able to do it. So I I want to be put in that situation where I would believe that somebody like me could could take, you know, a couple of guys out with just a bat. I agree. Mm-hmm. I don't take there offense are, to that at all. <laughs> there are some scenes where it's kind of like a movie trope where you just have to count on the bad guys not just shooting you from a distance away, you know? Like, But that happens in lots of movies where you just have to suspend your disbelief and just be like, yeah, they decided not to just shoot them from far away and they came in for closer combat. Well, and here Harley does, you know, she goes through that whole sequence fighting people with bats and and uh, paintball guns and then she ends the sequence just shooting a guy yeah she does use the gun at the end but then she like throws the gun away and i think she has like a snirk a smirk on her face like i don't like this gun she throws yeah. it off to the side yeah this is a nice it's not her too. preferred method yeah another little showdown between her and montoya so they've run into each other a few times I like this minivan with the mattresses on top for some reason. I thought for sure when I first saw this that somebody was going to land on the mattresses or something was going to happen, but I don't think anything really happens with them, if I remember correctly. This is a, this is a good use of Harley's character because it uh, her sort of taking in Cassandra. I guess they all sort of take in Cassandra. Uh, Black Canary does... Uh, Harley does, and uh, it sets them apart uh, from Roman, who we talked about, cares only about himself. Mm -hmm. That's just the continuation of the, there's people all around that are after Harley. (laughs) That was a Frito Kahlo looking person. But now these two are, are linked, so we're definitely making progress in terms of towards the plot and then towards bringing characters together. So these two are going to be together um, quite a bit now. I'm not as well versed in Cassandra Kane from the comics, but from what I've read of her, she doesn't talk. So yeah. it was weird for me to come into this film and be like, oh, she's actually really mouthy. <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. I, I was not expecting that. And I still don't know how I feel about it. Would it have been more interesting if this character didn't speak. Um, right. but, I ge- but I guess in some respects, it would be harder to pull that off because you almost yeah. kind of need her to explain herself. Right. Yeah, I um, I am not really sure about why like they used Cassandra Cain because they didn't, they didn't use the silent kind of thing. And I'm, I'm not sure that they really connected to much at all of like the comic book Cassandra Cain, but they wanted to use that name. I'm not really sure why they use the name. I, I try to be very flexible with like different versions of characters and stuff like that. So I try to go with it, but yeah, I'm not, I also, when I went into the movie, I thought they were going to at least do something with like, yeah, she doesn't speak or she just, she can speak maybe, but she just really doesn't like to or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it was different than I expected. I like the character here in the movie, um, but it was just not what I expected. So I have to try to like put aside what I thought going in. You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm okay with how they used her here, but sometimes I watch it and I think, wouldn't it be funnier if like Harley, if she didn't talk to Harley, but she was just kind of yeah, facial like like she sneered at her or she like yeah, you know, yeah. made made rolled her eyes at Harley or whatever, and Harley just like talk talk talked. You know, would have been kind of interesting. Yeah. But that it might have gotten old, so I can see why they yeah they chose to go another way. But I don't know. Sometimes I just think about it. I do really like here. So again, I'm kind of trying to this time that I'm watching. I'm trying to like keep track of the pacing. 
I do really like it here that they're kind of slowing down. They're going kind of domestic. Because it's been, there's been a lot happening. We've met a lot of people. There's been a lot of action scenes. There's been a lot of, like, you have to keep track of, like, who's where and what's happening. And so I feel like this was a really good time to sort of, like, slow down. We've got two people. Let's just watch them in the car. Let's watch them in the store. Let's watch them in the apartment. Like, it lets the audience catch their breath. It lets these characters kind of come to life a little bit more. Um, And it lets us just, like, get ready for the next part of the movie, you know? So I think that was also a good choice to kind of go domestic here at this point in the movie. Yeah, and this is... This goes back to... Yeah, this goes back to Harley wanting to be normal. This is a very normal thing for her to do, to go grocery shopping and uh, go up and down the aisles and throw stuff in her car. That's a very normal thing. Yeah. But then here are some references to Suicide Squad. But then you're right, like, this kind of, like... Uh, an illusion of normalcy but then it's going to end with her i think like just stealing all this stuff (laughs) harley just can't actually stick the landing when it comes to normalcy oh yeah here she's robbing it yeah that's what i thought i'm trying i'm trying to remember what she puts in the cart it's a lot of peeps (laughs) yep Uh, she had definitely the laxatives i remembered that yeah so it's not it's not really healthy oh and there's some twizzlers i think Oh, yeah. and some dog food, which or hyena food. Oh, yeah, for the hyenas. <laughs> so here's Doc's place. So I think this is, uh, there's some Harley Quinn comics where she lives, like, above a kind of store like this, I believe. Um, I don't read all the Harley Quinn comics, but I think there's something vaguely familiar about that. Here's Doc. So, so we finally get a nice guy in the movie, or at least we think we do here. <laughs> So I think there's a little kind of subtle joke here about the 32 and she says you always want the extra chili. Yeah, so you don't have to taste the cooking. I think later when uh Huntress comes here, I think Huntress orders the number 32 and I think she says mild. Oh, interesting. So we'll we'll I have think. to tr- we'll have we'll see if yeah, we track we'll tr- that. For that one. <laughs> Here's Harley's they- apartment. I like I like this little bonding between them where Harley is kind of a little bit embarrassed about the apartment, which just kind of shows a little bit of vulnerability of Harley. But then uh, Cassandra's actually like, oh, this is awesome. That yeah, is a nice little there's bondy. there's something actually really sad about Harley in terms of like her saying that Doc is the only person who's ever cared about her and mm-hmm. um, that she sort of realizes that maybe where she lives is not great. Maybe she doesn't mm-hmm. have the best life. Um, yeah. so there, there's a little sadness there. There was that picture of the nuns, too, which connects to that very opening, uh, you know, prologue. Uh, about her going to nun school or whatever. Brucey. <laughs> <laughs> After that hunky Wayne guy. Well, she has, uh, we have seen her interact with uh, the Batman. Mm hmm. Beaver. I think the Beaver is also a comic reference. I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. It's, I don't know for sure, but it seems to me like something that would be. (laughs) Oh, this is cool too. So I think this is kind of actually a key moment. I was trying to think about this again. Like, so Cassandra says, who's this? It's the Joker. And like Harley is like super surprised that she doesn't know who the Joker is, which I think is like, again, it's like a bonding thing because Harley has always been defined as Joker's girlfriend that all those people that are after are like, oh, Joker's girlfriend is, you know, vulnerable now or whatever but if this movie is about her kind of finding separation from joker it must be like refreshing for harley to have somebody who's like oh wait this person just knows me as me and is not even aware of joker so it's like really like a blank slate of i'm not defined by my relationship i'm just defined by myself yeah and cassandra immediately recognizes the joker as a jerk like she immediately (laughs) realizes like why would anybody like him because he's yeah, obviously he not a great yeah. guy. Yeah. And then that's all. And then she just turns her back on him, right? Like, so, yeah, I think that's, it's kind of like almost you could say it was just for laughs, but I think it actually is kind of an important thing about their relationship and Harley trying to take those steps towards finding her own kind of place. Her There's emancipation. Yep, there is. <laughs> her fantabulous emancipation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like how Doc is kind of 
looking her up and down because he apparently knows everybody except her. She knows languages. So is that a part of Huntress that she knows multiple languages or she's just a quick study at things like that? Or? That I don't know of, but uh, yeah. but she's a smart character. I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past her to okay to learn things. Yeah. I think that's they, cool too. It reminds me of a Wonder Woman too. Of like, of course I speak languages. Like, don't you? <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, here we get the fuller, fuller story of the backstory here with the Bertinelli's. Yeah, and in the context of this iteration of the Bertinelli's, she is a little more um, well traveled, and she has more culture to her. So that sort of plays into how she might uh, know more languages. Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. She like grows up abroad and stuff. Yeah, again, look at the golds, like just really vibrant colors. Amazing. So the Bertinelli's were a powerful um, ma mafia family, right? And they're getting taken out. The the, the purple uh, toy there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the car. That's right. It's like a toy car, I think, right? Is that the, does she give that to Cassandra later on, I think? Actually, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember. I think I missed that in theaters that that was the same like toy, but it, it was just me missing it. It's my fault. They definitely made a clear shot of it on camera. So here is finally like a guy with he's a killer, but he has at least a little bit of compassion. I'm trying to find any sort of redeemable guys in the movie. <laughs> Although, yeah, they are assassins. And sort yeah. of help train her to be one herself. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of purple in the wardrobe. I'm getting another Wonder Woman vibe here of the training and yeah, getting those skills. Ouch. So to me, this is kind of endearing where she's trying to like figure out how to how to announce herself and stuff and what she's going to say. Oh, I hated uh, this. Really? Uh, yeah. I wondered if you did. Well, the reason I don't like it is because we're supposed to be taking her story so seriously. Like she's had this traumatic yeah. thing that happened to her family when she was a kid. And we're supposed to take her revenge seriously. She's a crossbow killer. She's been killing all these people. And here we see her as like this jokey character in the mirror and that yeah. to me just didn't gel. I was like, "Do you want me to take her seriously or not?" Uh, there was a there was a mixed tone there that I, I didn't it, I didn't care for. Yeah, so it is mixed. I definitely see it. I think the the jokey part comes in when it goes back to Harley's narration, like right there at the end, like Harley narrating, and Harley is kind of the one who's giving the Huntress nameplate, you know. So it's almost like Harley can't help it, but kind of be a little bit silly and crazy like that even on something that should be kind of serious and sad, you know? Yeah, Harley wouldn't take it seriously. Although at one point Harley does say, like, you know, you have this traumatic childhood. So, like, the psychiatrist in Harley kind of recognizes it, but still as Harley Quinn, she can't, yeah, still can't take it seriously. So yeah. this scene is, um, to me, it's one of the standout scenes. Like, I think everybody who saw the movie, you just remember this scene. And it, it's, it's a credit to... Ewan McGregor's acting, I think, for it, too. Well, and there's a real seriousness to the scene because it's... Uh, you just see him really embarrass this woman. Yeah. And it's hard to watch. Yeah, like, look at him kind of doing this dance. Now you dance. Yeah, it's, it's just terrifying. And also, again, it's like, he got bad news, and so he's now just taking this bad news out on somebody that's completely uninvolved. And, like, when he heard her laughing, he's just like, is she laughing at me? So, again, he's just, like, this narcissist who, whatever he hears, he sort of thinks, like, is that about me? I assume it's about me. And then he's going to just go on this power trip because it's his club. You know, it's just, he's very uh, hateful. Hate, he's a hateable kind of guy. Just totally ruining these people's night out. It's also creepy how Zaz kind of seems to be enjoying this, like, while he's watching it. That's weird. At least this guy is, like feels very uncomfortable to have to do this and he quietly like says i'm sorry you know he doesn't know what else to do because this roman is a guy that could just kill you you know yeah and um, dinah dinah has mm -hmm. to watch it and she's tearing up a little bit yeah and then she tries to get out of there like she's like i can't stay here and watch this but then yep again he grabs her 
you wouldn't betray me, would you? It's always about him, man, this guy. But he actually is correct on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what a creep. Yeah. You know, you know, Dinah is hard on her, you know, down on her luck if she has to, she feels like she has to work for him just to earn a living. Oh, that was pretty good too. I just noticed there Huntress, like Huntress was there, but she sees Zaz, like her final look is at Zaz who's on her kill list. Yeah. So that makes sense. It's funny that Montoya still has this shirt on. Man, that chick's, those, that, that chick's glasses, man. Those are some old, like, 1980s style <laughs> eyeglasses. It's a little bit, um, a little retro. Because I think this is supposed to take place, what, 2016, something like that, after the death of Superman? Oh, yeah, I didn't think about exactly when. Um, yeah, somewhere after the death, but before the rise, maybe? Yeah, I don't know. I hadn't ever replaced it, really, but somebody probably has in DCEU websites. So the, the, the style of those glasses sort of throws, throws me uh, back to the 1980s. Yeah, those are way, <laughs> definitely way different. And maybe she just like likes uh, retro glasses. Yeah. I like this kind of running gag, too, about Montoya being, like, from an 80s. Maybe that was part of the joke, is that they always say Montoya is, like, from an 80s cop show or oh, cop, you know, yeah, cop movie. Oh, yeah, that, that makes sense, actually, yeah. That's a good and call. And you're like saying, like, you know, you know, in those old cop movies, it never gets serious until the person turns in their badge, and that's when the real stuff happens, you know? Yeah. It's kind of funny. I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. <laughs> yeah, probably the, uh, you know, the makeup, hair, and wardrobe team, like, saw those notes about the, the 80s jokes, and they said, like, we can go 80s. <laughs> yeah. We can get some 80s in there. Nailed it. So here, this that this is the end of the domestic life that they had for just a few minutes. Yeah, her domestic life only gets to last for a short amount of time before she's taking back to taken back to reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another grievance. She doesn't know who it is, but <laughs> no eggplant. That's interesting. Oh yeah, I wasn't sure here. Bruce kind of goes towards the explosion. I was worried about Brucey for a while. First time I saw it. And she actually hardly does seem kind of emotionally upset here about possibly losing Brucey. But she's definitely losing her. What she's trying to carve out of some sort of normal life is, is just got a whole, big hole blown in it. Yeah. Well, I guess that's part of her emancipation. She's trying to build a life outside of the Joker and it's yeah. literally yeah. blown up. Yeah, yeah. She's really, like, really has to go to start somewhere new. She's got to give all that stuff up and find a new spot. So this is also the doc who I was hopeful might be a redeeming kind of guy, but he's too, like, nope. Too much pressure, too much money. Like, he also sold her out. The only person who ever cared, up, cared about her. At least he's sorry about it, I guess. <laughs> And it seems like she's genuinely, the way Margot plays her here, she's genuinely broken up about it. Yeah. Yeah, she, I like how Harley, like, she does have some emotions underneath. She's not totally the surface. Like, in some of the uh, animated versions, I actually really like the Harley Quinn animated show that's out now. But some other versions, like, Harley kind of just seems like that surface craziness here. But I like how Margot brings some emotion in at these certain moments. Like even in Suicide Squad, when she was on top of that car and she thought yeah. she'd lost Joker and stuff. And she can bring that, like, Harley is still a real person, even though she's super crazy and has all this, you know, like, unexpected kind of stuff that you never know is, what gonna, is gonna happen. She has the emotions underneath it. Nice use of lighting here with all the light coming out of the phone booth. Which, again, feels like it's <laughs> maybe out of a, an 80s cop movie because you don't really see, <laughs> see people using uh, phone booths today. Yeah, um, right. Having a phone booth at all. Yeah. It's kind yeah. Of a th throwback. <laughs> this purple is really nice, though. Beaver. 
it's good how she was kind of looking through the glass of the uh, phone booth, and then he's looking in the glass, and then she's looking in the glass. They kind of have triple triple visual connection there. But I like that purple on the wall. Now we're starting to get some faster cuts as you know from multiple places to show that things are kind of starting to come together. He's got a lot of uh, uh, Roman has a lot of mirrors so that he mm-hmm. can see himself mul- multiple mm-hmm. views of himself, which I guess plays more into his narcissism and the mask aspect of his character. Yeah. There's that drinking problem that was alluded to earlier, but now we kind of see it going on. Uh, Montoya's taken her work home with her. Yeah. You can see all the, the, the murder board on hit on her uh, mirror there. Yeah. This is a nice shot. So the, not only the purple on the street, but Harley and Cassandra going down, like kind of going down out of screen, because this is also the moment where Harley is actually like, she regrets that she almost sold Cassandra out. Yeah. So that's Harley like going to something that is actually a low point for her. And I like how they're actually descending down and you're kind of almost losing them into this moment. But luckily they get it back, you know, before the end. But Zaz, man, I hate this guy. I mean, I love him. I love the character, <laughs> but man, I hate this guy. But he's he's observant. Like, he's right on. As soon as he sees that, he knows. You you can really see his scars really well there in this in this scene, all yeah, all down his neck and all over his face. Yep, I like the uh, emotion here that Roman has. Like he's just starting to crumble inside. Like you almost see kind of the weakness of him, but he covers it up with this violence and rage. You know. Yeah, he always seems very in control, um, but here he couldn't control Dinah. Man, those paintings are messed up. Yeah, they're weird. So messed up. Here's the mask. I like the mask. Um, I know probably a lot of people have a lot of different thoughts on the mask, but like for me, when I when it goes down and looks at him, like it looks pretty cool to me. I mean, he looks like Black Mask from the comics. This is a cool, this to me is a very Joker, Harley kind of setting. Like you can't get much more Joker or Harley than this. Well, and it's also like very Gotham. A creepy amusement park. Yeah. It's very a Gotham-esque. Weird woman's mouth that they're going in, yeah. That and was they're a going nice inside the, they're going shot. inside the um, female clown too. Right. That's right. <laughs> like this is taping her to the toilet because she's really hoping for her to have a bowel movement. <laughs> See, what is it with all the, like, the the big DC Birds of Prey characters being depicted just sitting on the toilets? I have some real yeah. issues with that. Yeah, there's there's definitely multiple toilet scenes in here. <laughs> I know, and uh, Alessandro, our friend, he uh, was not a fan of the Aquaman toilet scene either, so maybe just some people don't like toilets. And, That's, and it's DC literal humor. potty humor, Sam. <laughs> I don't care for it. Another showdown. There's multiple showdowns here between Montoya and Harley, but this one's going to be the most intense. And then you're right. Like, so we're coming to the point where they're going to all kind of start arriving. And I think it's set up well that they all have a reason that they're arriving. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. They've had pairwise interactions, which builds some kind of basis on which they could have the team. But also I appreciate that just in terms of just the mechanics of the plot, they all have a motivation for like why they have to team up. Even if they don't really want to team up, they're kind of like, well, I guess I need to to survive this, and I guess you need to because of that, and we all sort of have the same, you know, danger or enemy. So there's kind of a little bit of some personal rapport and also some just the situation demands that they, I guess, they have to work together. So for me, I I bought it, you know, the first time I was watching it, that they would have to work together at the end. Yeah, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. And there the, the handcuff thing from Cassandra comes back around. The being able to swap out of the handcuffs. Now that, when the arrow comes in, the dart comes in, like I at first thought it was Huntress, but that's actually a nice little, um, you know, they faked out the audience that it's actually Zaz with the dart, not yeah. Huntress. It's weird that Harley says bye-bye birdie to uh, Montoya. Oh, yeah. Seems like she'd say that more to Dinah. Yeah. 
And Dinah's like, she taped you to the toilet? And I'm like, Dinah, you were depicted on the toilet earlier in the film. You should be objecting <laughs> to that. It's my biggest pet peeve of this whole film. Which I know is stupid. But I have issues. So we can add Zaz to our list of creeps. I obviously he was pretty creepy before, but now he's like directly creepy to Harley. And um, that's a and lot then... of cutting on his chest. It's good makeup. At first, I wasn't um, sure that we were going to get like the full scar treatment, but then here it's like, yep, yeah, they saved it for the end, where it's like, nope, it's it's legit, the full scarring thing, you know, representing his kills, and just the all the violence that he's been involved in. <laughs> he can figure it out. He's pretty smart. But of course he has different ideas. He's just thinking, well, let's just cut it out. Yeah, that's gross. But he would do it. He's a character we, we know would be threatening enough to do it. Yeah, and this is good, just dramatic irony too, where like we know that Zaz has already found Dinah out, but Dinah doesn't know that Zaz has found her out. So it's just some good dramatic tension there. So this is this is pretty good. I remember when I was watching this in theaters, you know, like you're kind of wondering with Harley paralyzed, like, is she going to do something to get out of this? How are they going to get out of it? Yeah. And then it's actually Huntress like arrives. Um, so but it's some good tension building. Like I was I was legitimately sort of intrigued when I was watching this in theaters. Yeah. And so that that going into his neck, uh, is sort of uh, echoing what we saw earlier with the fake out uh, with Zaz uh, mm -hmm. earlier earlier when we saw it in the scene. I like Harley here. She gets yeah, this little, she's doing what she the can. lower part of her arm and stab him. <laughs> Pretty impressive that Montoya got back up there. One last stab. That's funny. <laughs> So now they're all together. It's I like this too that they're all together, but it's in this standoff, right? Like she's pointed at her, she's pointed <laughs> at her, uh, and now Cassandra even gets in on the standoff. So it's to me, it's a kind of, you know, it's it's a trope of having the kind of standoff like this. But I think it's kind of cool as this is the way that they meet each other, especially since it's kind of you know, they're kind of a hodgepodge group. It's not like they're all like pure heroes. Yeah, they're not. They're not exactly uh, friends yet. Especially Montoya, like being, you know, a police officer, like to join up with these folks is not guaranteed. So it kind of makes sense that they would start at tension with each other and then kind of realize like, oh, wait, we have no choice really but to do this together. It's, it's a little bit of sort of an apology from Harley to Cassandra, I think. It's going to take Cassandra a little while to forgive her, but... This is when I started to like Huntress more and more. And then from here to the end, I kind of just like everything about Huntress. Whereas like by the end of the movie, I realized I really liked her. Yeah, they do a good job with Huntress's uh, wardrobe for the most part. Um, you see the the knuckle gloves uh, sort of echo the the like the gauntlet she would have on. And then the the midriff, she's often depicted with the midriff showing. And that's that's very... Um, character correct for uh huntress in the comics is that she's often drawn with her bedroom showing mm -hmm. and when i rewatched it i like i gave the the creators a lot more leeway on how huntress was not really developed in the first part first half of the movie and then she is you know she gets sort of some stuff to do in the second half of the movie at first i kind of critiqued that but i give it more leeway now because in rewatching it like, Harley literally says in the middle of the movie, like, oh, wait, I forgot to tell you about, like, Huntress, you know, and let me tell you her backstory and stuff. So it's like, okay, the creators, like, absolutely knew that they were bringing in Huntress kind of on, mostly on the back half of the movie. And they just either just decided because of what else they were balancing that they had to do it that way, um, or they wanted to do it that way, you know, to kind of have her be mysterious until the end. Um, so for me, I'm like, okay, you know, my first time watching it, I sort of wanted more Huntress earlier. But now I realize, like, no, like, that was a very clear creative decision that they even call out in the narration itself. 
And she's sort of telling her own story here. It's not like Harley's depiction of her. It seems like she's more in control of explaining herself. Yeah, so at first we get some glimpses, then we get Harley's version, and then we get Huntress like herself more. So to me, that's a progression that kind of makes sense. There's a nice little black mask coming in. And this is how they set it up for the the team to have a bunch of people to fight, is to say, like, Black Mask just called in all the mercenaries and said, you know, like, half a million for anybody who can get the girl. Which, to me, that's a plausible way to just get a lot of bad guys in there to fight. With these action movies or superhero movies, you always have to have some sort of, you know, some explanation for why there's a bunch of baddies. (laughs) Yeah. And this is a real, like, um, down-to-earth fight. It's not like a big superhero brawl or anything. It's just, Mm -hmm. you know, humans fighting each other. Although one of them does have a superpower, uh, which is awesome. And we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there, but, um, but it's very, it's very down to earth and and practical in the way they have to fight. Yeah. So here's the, here's the turn into act three, basically, or into the, the final act, you know, of the, of explicitly kind of saying like, "Hey, we we're in this situation. We got to do it." And Montoya's on board. I like Huntress here. Sure, <laughs> I like Huntress. <laughs> to me, it's like I I don't know like what there are plans for after this, but I would like to see more Huntress, uh, and I also would like to see more Black Canary too, actually. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So I'm assuming this was Joker's little stash. Is that what it was? I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, Harley uh, assumed that there'd be something there. I see some ha ha ha's on the window too. I noticed. Yeah. Over there. Um, this is kind of interesting. Where I like this little shot where we're, you know, we wonder what they're pulling out of that chest and then the camera comes all the way down and then it goes right into black mask. It's a nice long shot here. It's pretty cool. Very blue out here. One thing I like here is that it looks like Ewan McGregor is actually talking in the mask. Yeah. Like, they didn't just have him standing there and then dub it in. Like, it still might be dubbed. It probably is dubbed. But when they were filming it, he actually was delivering the lines in that mask. Yeah. I like the use of all the the bad guys wearing a mask. That's pretty cool. There's a nice little... Some grenades that'll become important later. Brass knuckles. Oh, Daddy's Little Monster. So that's the Suicide Squad <laughs> shirt, I think. Nice, nice yeah. Easter egg and a throwback. And then that's more of the classic. Uh, the Harley, Harley look, shirt, yeah. Or Harley, yeah, top. So we get a costume change for Harley, which is good. And there's the mallet. It's going to be good. <laughs> uh, Huntress is good. So I don't really know the actress for Huntress. Um, so it's uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. I don't know if I've seen her in anything else or not. I but, haven't either. But yeah, she definitely grew on me by the end of the movie. A big time. <laughs> I've missed that. Yeah, Harley has a little bit of home court advantage here. Yeah, that's right. She like knows to go down here. She kind of knows where things are going. So this is a pretty good Huntress moment here where the others just slide down and have fun and she actually has to take out this guy in the tunnel. It's pretty good. This is good camera work. I just I'm yeah. appreciating that more. The camera kind of slid under and went down the tunnel as well. That must have been fun to shoot. So now we're getting kind of a mixture of colors, so it's going to it's gonna move through different colors, I think. Yeah, the lights here are beautiful. It it And it looks real like it would be like in a fun house if you were going through like a fun house yeah so here's one of those moments though where i was saying like it's just lucky that the guys did not bring guns because they sh- could have just shot them right there oh but yeah luckily they all brought like hand to hand hand to hand weapons and like 
even Montoya isn't very effective with her gun either. Well, Montoya's also drunk, so uh, she's true. probably oh, not Yeah, that's at right. She's drunk in this whole peak operating uh, yeah. performance here. But they they definitely so this is like a quite a complex set and there's multiple parts of it and they really choreographed with the set in mind, you know. They used the trampolines and the different teeter-totters and the mirrors and everything they really incorporated into the fight. It's always also one thing I look for with action scenes is like in a setting that's interesting, right? Like not just, for example, like in a gray airport or something, but like yeah, yeah, having something uh, well, that's visually appealing. What or, are you, tra- what are you trying to say, in- Sam? Are you? Uh, <laughs> I just pulled something out. I just pulled something <laughs> You're just out of making nowhere. up the the airport as an example. <laughs> but just that you like your eye has something really interesting to take in while you're also taking in like the physical physicality of it. Yeah. And there's a lot of depictions of women in the scene, uh, female heads. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Like right here right at the shot. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I missed that before. Like the, I think I caught the one where they were walking in at the start, but I don't think I noticed how many were in the scenery here. Just all the jumping on the tongues and stuff is interesting. Now, if this was BVS, there would probably be some, like, really deep thematic connection of tongues and, like, what tongues represent. Yeah. But I think in this one, I think it's just visually interesting and it makes for some fun fight scenes. <laughs> Maybe it's about the, the birds of prey finding their voice. Because you could, you could tie that into uh, the canary cry that happens a little bit later. Yeah. There's the hands, which we saw the hands in the initial, you know, Black Canary song. There was the hands holding the eyes. Now we have these yeah. hands sticking up. I have no idea what it means, though. (laughs) So they they threw in a couple um, things, too, about the, okay, so when did Harley have time for a shoe change? And then there's the hair tie thing coming up. So, like, right now, the hair is in Dinah's face, and she kind of gets a little bit annoyed when she has to, like, get it out of her face, and so then Harley gives her a hair tie. Yeah. Like, that's... That's stuff I haven't seen in, in like, you know, John Wick. They don't do, like, the shoe and hair tie stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, that comes from a female perspective. For sure. <laughs> like what it would really feel like to be in this fight. Yeah. So there's the hair tie. Yeah. I think it's it's cool. Because I'll tell, I'll tell you that like putting your hair up in something like this is, it makes you perform much better. If you're fighting, mm-hmm. if you're running, if you're, you know, doing any kind of physical activity. It makes a difference. Mm-hmm. And so that's just, a, it's a kind of a voice, you know, in terms of creative voice in action scenes that we just haven't had a lot in cinema, you know? Yeah. And, now we're hopefully kind of coming into this era of getting multiple voices. Not that one is right or one is wrong, but just having more voices yeah. involved in the creative process. And also bashing heads. Wow. <laughs> and balls. Yeah. But yeah, that was some good mallet work, which is pretty classic. I like I like that shot of the, the group shot of them. Yeah, it's cool. It's nice, you know, having the kind of the group shot at the end of the fight, you know, and Rather than like, it's typically been at the beginning of fights, you know, where you kind of get the hero shot. Now this I do think is pretty stupid of all of them. They are just really nonchalantly like walking out into, like clearly Black Mask was still out there and more guys were still out there. Like there yeah. was no reason to think they were done. Well, but. I guess they 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 had that um, that high of like beating up all those guys. They thought they had, you know, taken yeah. care of business. Yeah, I'm gonna chalk it up to they weren't just were not thinking clearly because obviously it was really stupid to just walk straight out like smiling but that's cool she she was wearing the red and black top and it was bulletproof it's nice again harley's pink like really stands out strong like yeah the lighting and the set design and colors is amazing in this movie i like from a perspective of like forcing black canary in the situation where she has to use the canary cry because the whole film yeah, i'm like are they going to show it are they going to show it and when once they got to this point i was like she's going to use it she's totally going to use it because they've done a good job in the writing to force her to this place yeah she's reluctant to but now it's like all right now they're pinned you know like they're totally pinned down so she has to and montoya i like to montoya kind of telling her like you have to do this so i think it was shot cool i like the waves coming out I like the guys flying back. It looks really good. Sound I will say good. The, yeah, the the first second of the sound design, I wasn't sure if I loved it, but then like when it really gets going, like the second second, third second, fourth second, 
I really like it. They start to bring in this kind of like bird edge to it. Yeah. Um, so by the time it's like fully going, I really liked the sound. Ooh. Wow. Okay. That hurt. Yeah. And it also emphasizes that Dinah knew she had that power. There, yep. There's a yeah, story. There's right a story there that hasn't been told. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like by the end of this movie, it's like. By the end of this movie, I'm ready for a Birds of Prey movie. Like, this, like you said, is really more of a Harley Quinn movie. But by the end of it, I want to see more Huntress. Montoya is really interesting, kind of damaged, you know, troublesome kind of character, but knows her stuff. And then, like, yeah, you're right. Like, Dinah Lance, there's a story about her mom and how she came to that power, why she's reluctant to use it, you know, what's she going to do now with Huntress. So to me, this is almost like the prequel to a Birds of Prey movie rather than like really a Birds of Prey movie. Yeah, and I think that's the the intent behind it. I think uh, Margot Robbie really loved the female characters of the DC Universe, so she was trying to find a way that she could commercially sell some of them. And mm-hmm. the, the Birds of Prey, even though I love them, they're a harder sell for the general audience. So I, yeah. I think it was smart of her to try to bring them into a Harley movie because she knew a Harley movie would sell. Um, right. so it, it sucks and it's also smart at the same time. Like it sucks. I wish it was a genuine Birds of Prey movie, but yeah. it's also smart that she did that. Yeah. Um, I like the roller skates here. So bringing the roller skates back around, there is the Harley connection in the, some, especially some recent comics with the roller skates and roller derby. Right. But I also just like it as a memorable, unique kind of way to end the action of the movie is with this roller skate sequence. Like I can't, I don't have, I don't have any memories of like other roller skate sequences. I, I can think of Back to the Future with a skateboard and yeah. then a hoverboard, but, but these roller skates is, is cool and they use it well. It's like, so, so they didn't just say, oh yeah, we're going to have roller skates. And then they kind of like, you know, half assed it or something. It's like, no, they thought we're going to do roller skates and we're going to do some really cool stunts and some cool, you know, planning about how to use the roller skates. And again, the gymnastics has been really good for Harley all the way through. This is one of the best gymnastic moves coming up here when she like jumps into the car, like to do this jump right here, and to, she like oh, has yeah. to tightly pull herself in to go into the window. It's pretty good. Probably helped that she had those roller skates on to do that. She bails. So she didn't know if Cassandra was going to survive there, I guess, but she just had to bail. So this part reminds me of the Ace Chemicals at the opening. So it's kind of like a bookend because at the beginning she, you know, had that she left the truck, she jumped out and the truck went in and then blew up like Ace Chemicals. And here she like dove to the side and then that car went in and it also like it has this setting of what founders whatever. And she's and she's uh, sort of limping pier. too. You mentioned the limp. And yeah, yeah, she's before. got the limp, you're right. So she's but this time now instead of like walking away and leaving behind like the Joker, she's actually running toward Cassandra, who's going to be like her new partner, you know? So to me, that's kind of this, it's a bookend visually, um, especially with the limp kind of, I think means they were probably purposeful in connecting them. But it shows the growth of the character from like, I'm trying to leave somebody behind to I'm trying to find a new person, like I'm trying to find a new connection in my life. And it's also a contrast to the earlier uh, example where there's a lot of color and it's sort of celebratory with the uh, almost firework look. Mm-hmm. Here she's going into clouds, mist, yeah, darkness. Just, just dark fog, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so sometimes that, that thing that felt celebratory at the beginning, yeah, it's flashier. It's flashier to kind of try to do that clean break, but what's harder is to actually go into starting a new relationship. Yeah, I like this too. I like how this last part is just kind of some tension and a showdown with Black Mask. They don't try to do like another action scene. Because I think we, we finished and we had the good action scene. Now I think it's better to just have the character moment and the just direct tension with Black Mask. And she can basically like kind of call out Black Mask from what she's kind of psychoanalyzed about him. I think it's pretty good. And the atmosphere does make me scared for Harley because you can't really see anything... So it has a good sense of suspense. Mm -hmm. So that statue earlier might have been a nice foreshadowing of that it's going to be a statue of Black Mask and not actually him, right? Yeah. Yeah, they set that up earlier in the film. 
And he's demasked now. Now all you see is Roman's face. Yeah. And it's all bloody too. It's not pristine like a like a mask would be. And so Harley's like... Harley's face is bloodied and uh, her makeup's running, so she's not as pristine as a mask would be either. Yeah. Um, I'm noticing that, like we were talking about going into the fog and trying to find forge a new relationship, which is sometimes harder. Um, but there, Harley did apologize, like um, straight up apologized, which is kind of what you need to do sometimes to make a friend. This is a nice one last little acrobatic move. Yeah. Ooh, he's not coming back. That's ugly. <laughs> there's there's the R rating a little bit right there. Yeah, uh, definitely. <clears throat> I like that as a finish, like Cassandra Kane's, you know, quick fingers kind of um, comes around as the way to have the finish. Yeah. And really Cassandra was like protected. You know how during the earlier fight scene, really all of the women were trying to protect Cassandra Kane and saying like, go over here, you'll be safe, you know, like close your eyes. Um, And so she's sort of sheltered from the fight until the end. And then Cassandra Kane has to do that last little part. Yeah. And here we come full circle, too, with uh, instead of the women drinking and kind of talking rumors and stuff, um, bad talking about Harley now, she's with them and they're kind of talking as sort of friends. They're at least uh, wanting her to sit with them. And yeah. they're they're drinking that same green, I guess those are margaritas. Yeah. So uh, she's bringing a little yeah, Harley to them. Up. Yep, so it's all wrapping up. Nice little bit of closure. <laughs> a little bit of closure to the diamond too. It's good to see Black Canary laughing and kind of she's. This is like the most free that Black Canary has been, I think. Well, she's, she's on her more. own. She's been emancipated yeah. because she doesn't have to work for Roman anymore. Yeah. And then Huntress has has finished her kill list, right? So she's now free to figure out what she actually wants to do with her life now instead of just vengeance. <laughs> Montoya is sort of setting up the idea that uh, they might have to face somebody else. Yeah. And there's the 80s, the 80s cop joke kind of finishes here. It's good. Yeah, this was when I was first watching the movie that I realized I really liked Huntress, but it just took me, like, till the end of the movie to realize. Which is a little bit different than normal. You know, usually th the movie tries to endear you to a character, like, right from the start. So to me, this is Harley. Like, Harley, again, that unpredictableness and that sort of thing is that she can't just, like, sit there and sort of have the most predictable things happen. She has to just like, nope, I took off and I took that car and I'm going on my own. But she does have Cassandra with her. So it's still some growth for the character. But, you know, Harley is always has that unpredictable edge. Yeah, and it's pin, it's pin it's weird because we've talked about Harley as a character who wants normalcy. Well, well, she had the normalcy there hanging out with her friends, drinking margaritas. But then she chose to be impulsive and chose to... Yeah. Um, get out of the normalcy person. yeah she she sort of wants the normalcy but she really can't accept it you know it's like it's kind of that just that paradox Here, so here's some different costumes for him here you're actually seeing huntress and black canary kind of embodying their comic book counterparts with yeah. the uh, wardrobe there that's a that's a good tease interesting jacket there for harley too now she gets a real business card that's kind of cool You found Bruce, so that's a happy ending for that. And they get their breakfast sandwich. So it all comes around. <laughs> Cassandra it's... has the heart on her cheek, too. I, I just noticed that. Yeah. It's kind of emulating Harley a little bit. Oh, littering, so she's still a little bit. Still a little, a little dangerous. <laughs> still a little criminal. Harley's gonna Harley. Yeah. I like that 
kind of eye. Yeah. Red and blue on the eyes. <laughs> it's, good. it's a good play on her hair color. There's that yeah. female oh, yeah, there's clown. That. Yep. So that was Kathy Ann Modest Muscle. A, like a lot movie. of eyes there. Uh, yeah. oh, eye motifs yeah. through the visual huh. visuals. Wow. I think we did better than I was expecting. We picked up on some of that, some of that stuff. Well, so we don't always talk through all the credits. So um, to wrap up, oh, David Ayer. Okay, cool. Um, so to wrap up, I always just, I'm kind of curious about like where you'd put it with the DCU. I know I'm kind of springing this on you. We didn't talk about this ahead of time. So I'll go first. Um, so I like the movie. Um, I try to, you know, I love Man of Steel BVS and like, I love the philosophy of it. I love sort of really digging into the deep connections and it makes me think. Um, but I don't really want every movie to be BVS because I just don't have the time or energy. <laughs> like I, I like BVS, like, like that kind of movie to come around every few years because I kind of do, you know, sit with it for a long time and think about it, talk about it. And so I'm kind of happy in the universe that not all the movies are like that. So that's kind of why I appreciate Shazam. I like this movie. Um, so for me, like the DCEU is a lot of movies that I enjoy and then some that I just really, really adore. So for me, like BVS is the top. Um, Man of Steel is just under that. I, I love Wonder Woman. I think that's a really good movie overall. And it kind of is like a, it's a little bit, a little bit deep, but a little bit good and a little bit mainstream. It's kind of like a nice mix of that, um, that I appreciate. So those three are kind of on the top for me. Um, and then I get into this middle zone, which is probably like Shazam, Aquaman, Birds of Prey, probably in that order, but they're all like very close. Um, and then like on the bottom, I have like the studio interference zone, which yeah. is like, um, for me, probably Justice League, because it does have some, some Zack Snyder elements in it, and it has some parts that I can appreciate. Um, and then Suicide Squad is probably, like, those two are my lower ones. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how it goes for me. Like, pretty clear tiers of, like, BVS, Man of Steel, Wonder Woman on the top, and then Shazam, Aquaman, Birds of Prey in the middle, and I like them. And then Justice League, Suicide Squad, which I can find things to enjoy about them, but they're kind of an, another step down, and I wish that the student, studio hadn't, like, kind of taken over those movies. But, like, how do, how do things sort of, like, flesh out for you in that? I think we're almost the same, except I would flip Suicide Squad and Justice League. I think I would put Justice League mm -hmm. at the bottom. Suicide yeah, Squad. I think a I lot think, of people do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Suicide Squad would be above Justice League. But, yeah, I would go BBS, Man of Steel, Wonder Woman, Shazam, Aquaman. Well, actually, no, I would put maybe Birds of Prey above Aquaman. Mm -hmm. And then Suicide Squad, Justice League. Yeah. No, that we're pretty close. Um, and, like, with Justice League, if I judge Justice League against what I, like, hoped it would have been or what it could have been, then, like, Justice League goes way down. But if I try to judge Justice League on, you know, like, are there parts of it that I appreciate and characters in it that I like, you know, then I actually put it a little bit above Suicide Squad. So it's kind of like what could have been is, I think, what really brings Justice League down is when people just think about what could have been. No, I'm, I'm thinking about what <laughs> Justice League is. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's I can understand either way. But, yeah, that's where I would line up. So cool. Well, yeah, we're pretty similar, but overall Birds of Prey, like, as you could tell, we really were gushing about, you know, the colors and the set design and some of the characters that we really kind of appreciated watching. I think the movie has a clear personality, which I really appreciate about Birds of Prey. Like, I think the creative team got to do what they were hoping to do. I think they like achieved it. Um, and they brought some humor into it, that, that color into it. The stunts were good. You know, the action was entertaining. And like I said, I'm kind of glad that it didn't take itself too seriously because I honestly, I don't need every movie to take itself that seriously. I like it when films do and they do a good job of it, but I'm also happy if a movie's like, no, we're going to have some fun. We're going to play around with things. So for those reasons, like I, you know, I can enjoy Birds of Prey pretty well. Yeah. For it being a Harley Quinn movie, I, I'm fine with that. Um, it's, yeah. it's where they put the humor and the silliness with characters who don't need it, like Huntress. That's where I have the mm -hmm. issue, but but I agree with you. I like that it looks like it comes across as this is the movie that Kathy wanted to make. And so for that, I appreciate it. 
All right. Well, that's our commentary of Birds of Prey. Uh, thanks again for listening to the Justice League Universe podcast. You can find us at jlupodcast.podomatic.com. We're also on Patreon at patreon.com slash jlupodcast. And Rebecca, I really appreciate talking to you, uh, talking with you through this movie. If there's anything you want to plug, go ahead and do that. Yeah, uh, I'm also the co-host of a podcast called Supergirl Radio. So if you have an interest in Supergirl, check us out at supergirlradio.com. And thanks, Sam. It's been a, it's been too long since we've done one of these. So I really uh, appreciate uh, getting to watch a, watch a good DCEU film with you. All right. And we can definitely uh, get back together in 2021 for Zack Snyder's uh, We're going to have to. <laughs> All right. Cool. Take care. All right.